Bing bong, bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. Welcome to Bud Mouse. This is Joe, the bearded historian. He'll tell you an interesting history. Be careful of his soldiers. They can be brats. This is Angel. She's an entity. She'll cause his us and plant her hands at you. This is Sue. She likes spirits, not the alcohol. She's the reason this channel exists. This is David. He likes fire trucks. He's here occasionally. Bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong. We preserve his story. Welcome to Way Back Wednesday. Today, Joe's going to ramble about um, Revolutionary War. Um, we're going to have a race of snowmen. And we have one video before Christmas, one more live stream before Christmas. So, the things to look forward to Christmas. Are you ready for the shout out? Here we go. Shout out time is a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. This shout out is for our friends. Let's see who it is today. Maybe. Yeah, I can get it started. I always have trouble with this. Come on, start. There we go. Alright, let's see. We got Gen X and Owen and Mo Mona. There's Misha. Lashes, Sweet Pea, Hippie, Turtle, Praying, Visiting, Old Fart, uh, Ike Ontario, Freckled, Gen X is currently in the lead. We've got Wright, Jamaica, and um, Ontario over there again, which means I need to take that out of there. Carter, uh, Neil, Gen X is just really bopping this uh, race. Oh, where's everybody else? They're there. They're coming. There's Tez. And there's Trending. There's Lynn. And 755. And Makeup. And Journey. Oh, it looks like it's going to be Journey. Hang on a minute. Alright. The Journey Journals of Awakening is all human... All a human wants is freedom to be comfortable on this channel. We show support, subscribe, a chance to be a part of some life changing. Um, kind of a kind of a journal, kind of an interesting little channel. Journal of life and stuff. Check them out, like, share, comment. Have a good day. All right, Mr. Lightbud, what are you doing today? Today, class, we're going to discuss a name that is kind of familiar for those of you who have studied the Revolutionary War. A place out of Pennsylvania called Valley Forge. And interestingly enough, it functioned as the third of eight winter encampments for the Continental Army's main body commanded by General George Washington during the Revolutionary War. Now, in September of 1777, Congress fled Philadelphia to escape the British capture of the city, and after failing to retake Philadelphia, Washington led his 12,000-man army into the winter quarters of Valley Forge, located about 18 miles northwest of Philadelphia. And they stuck around for about six months, from December the 19th, 1777, to June the 19th, 1778. Now... At Valley Forge, the Continental Army struggled to maintain a disastrous supply crisis while retraining and reorganizing their units. Uh, between 1,700 and 2,000 soldiers would die from disease, possibly exacerbated by malnutrition. Let's eat right, kids. Yeah. Now, a uh, little backstory here. Now, Valley Forge consisted of a small proto industrial community located at the juncture of the Valley Creek and the Chaikill River. In 1742, the Quaker industrialists established the Mount Joy Iron Forge, largely thanks to capital improvements made by John Potts and his family over the following decades. The small community would expand the ironworks, establish mills, constructed new dwellings for the residents. Now, surrounding this valley was rich farmland where mostly Welsh Quaker farmers grew, 
wheat, rye, hay, Indian corn, and other crops, and then raised livestock, including cattle, pe uh, pigs, sheep, and barnyard fowl. Settlers of German and Swedish descent also lived nearby. Well, in the summer of 1777, the Continental Army's Quartermaster General, Thomas Mifflin, Mifflin. any Dunder Mifflin fans out there? <laughs> Uh, decided to station a small station a portion of his army supplies in the outbuildings around the fort just because of its variety of structures and the secluded location between two prominent hills. Fearing such a concentration of military supplies would undoubtedly become a target for British raids, the forge ironmaster William Dewey's Jr. expressed concerns about the army's proposal. Mifflin heeded Dewey's concerns but established a magazine at Valley Forge anyway. And not a reading magazine. What? Now, after the British landed at the head of Elk in present-day Elkton, Maryland, on the 25th of August, 1777, the British Army maneuvered out of the Ch Chesapeake Basin and towards Valley Forge. Now, following the Battle of Brandywine on the 11th of September, 1777, and the abortive Battle of the Clouds, interesting name for a battle, in, on September the 16th, on the 18th, several hundred soldiers under William Wilhelm von Mepshausen raided the supply magazine at Valley Forge. Despite the best efforts of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton, Angel's friend, Woo. and Colonel Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, the two Continental Army officers selected to evacuate the supplies from Valley Forge, Crown soldiers captured supplies, destroyed others, and burned down the forges and other buildings. Whoops. Now... Political, strategic, and environmental factors all influenced the Continental Army's decision to establish their encampment near Valley Forge that winter. Washington confirmed with the officers to select the site that would be most advantageous to the Army. Well, he first asked the generals where to quarter the Continental Army that winter on October the 29th, 1777. In addition to suggestions from his officers, Washington also had to contend with the recommendations of politicians. Don't politicians always do things the wrong way? What? Uh, Pennsylvania state legislatures and the Continental Congress expected the Continental Army to select an encampment site that could protect the countryside around Philadelphia. Some members of the Continental Congress also believed that the Army might be able to launch a winter campaign. Interested parties suggested other sites for an encampment, including Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Wilmington, Delaware. However, following the inconclusive Battle of White Marsh from December 5th through the 8th, Increasing numbers of officers and politicians began to appreciate the need to defend the greater Philadelphia region from British incursions. Now, considering these questions, an encampment at Valley Forge had notable advantages. Valley Forge's high terrain meant the enemy attacks would be difficult. Its location allowed for the soldiers to be readily detached to protect the countryside. Uh, proximity to the Shiko River would facilitate supply movements down the river, wide open areas, providing space for drilling and training. And on December the 19th, Washington conducted his 12,000-man army to Valley Forge to establish the encampment. Am I the only person who seems to think, hmm, winter time? This might be a bad thing. No, it seems like a good time. Good time <laughs> to march. Especially now, in the olden days. Right. Uh, now, the encampment was primarily situated along the high flat ground east of Mount Joy and south of the Hill River. In addition to the concentration of soldiers, Washington ordered nearly 2,000 soldiers to encamp at Wilmington, Delaware. He posted a, the Army's mounted troops at Trenton, New Jersey, and additional outposts at Downington and Radnor, Pennsylvania, among other places. So it wasn't just one single nest. He had several encampments, which is a smart move. Um, in the two winter encampments prior to Valley Forge, the Continental Army had sheltered themselves in a combination of tents, constructed huts, civilian barns, and other buildings. Valley Forge marked the first time Washington ordered, ordered his army primarily concentrated into a more permanent post where they constructed their own shelters. This strategic shift encouraged a whole new host of problems for the American patriots. Now, George Washington later wrote of the march into, into Valley Forge to see men without clothes to cover their nakedness without blankets to lay on, without shoes, by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet, and almost as often without provision as with, marching through frost and snow, and at Christmas taking up their winter quarters within a day's march of the enemy, without a house or hut to cover them, till they could be built, and submitting to 
it without a murmur is a mark of patience and obedience which in my opinion scarce can be paralleled sounds like a really horrible time all the way across sounds like a um uh a forced march or something uh i had a thought and now it's gone okay a bunch of stupidity pretty much the valley forge and cabin became the continental's army first large-scale construction of living quarters while no accurate account exists for the number of log, hu log huts built, experts estimate a range of between 1,300 and 1,600 structures. Well, then. Well, what are we going to do? Just go chop down that forest over there. Yeah. Um, no. no it might only take a day or two. Yeah. Now, there's no contemporary images of the Valley Forge Cantonment. The correspondence of General Washington and other soldiers' letters and notebooks are the only accounts of what took place. Brigadier General Louis Bejure de Pastel de Portail selected grounds for the brigade encampments and planned the defenses. Afterwards, Brigadier Generals appointed officers from each regiment to mark out the precise spot for every officer in all the enlisted men's huts. Despite the commander's attempts to, at standardization, the huts varied in terms of size, materials, and construction techniques. I wonder why. Well, because there's a whole bunch of different guys out there. No. Uh, military historian John B.B. Trussell Jr. writes that many squads dug their floors almost two feet below ground level to reduce wind exposure or the number of logs required for construction. That makes sense. In addition, some hutches had thatched straw roofs, while others consisted of brush, canvas, or clapboard. In a letter to his wife, Adrian Lafayette, described the huts as small barracks, which was scarcely more cheerful than dungeons. Oh, well then. Now, the Continental Army marched into Valley Forge with 12,000 people, mm -hmm. soldiers, artifactors, women, and children. Throughout the winter, Patriot commanders and legislatures faced the challenge of supplying the population the size of a colonial city. In May and June of 1777, the Continental Congress had authorized the reorganization of the Supply Department. Implementation of these changes never fully took effect because of the fighting surrounding Philadelphia. What? That makes it kind of hard to do anything. Uh, consequently, the supply chain was broken down even before the Continental Army arrived at Valley Forge. In large part, supplies dried up through the neglect of Congress so that by the end of December 1777, Washington had no way to feed or ad adequately clothe the soldiers. Washington chose the area partly for its strategic benefits but wintertime road conditions impeded supply wagons en route to the encampment. Now that winter, starvation and disease killed more than a thousand soldiers and perhaps as many as 1,500 horses. The men suffered from continual gnawing, hunger, and cold. Washington ordered the soldiers' rations either be one to one and a half pounds of flour or bread, one pound of salted beef or fish, or three quarters of a pound of salted pork, or one and a half pounds of flour or bread, a half pound of bacon or salted pork, a half pint of peas or beans, and one gill of whiskey or spirits. In practice, however, the army could not reliably supply the full ration. Perishable foods began to rot before reaching the troops because of poor storage, transportation problems, or confusion regarding the supplies' whereabouts. Other rations became lost or were captured by the enemy, Traveling to market proved dangerous for some vendors, while combined with the Continental Army's lack of hard currency, prices for perishable foods inflated. Uh, everybody remembers how the Continental uh, wasn't worth a Continental came about. Now, during those first few days of constructing the huts, Continentals primarily ate fire cakes, a tasteless mixture of flour and water cooked upon heated rocks. Sounds yummy. Oh, yeah. Uh, in his memoir, Joseph Plum Martin wrote that to go into the woods and build us habitations to stay, not to live in, in such a weak, starved, and naked condition was appalling at the highest degree. Resentment swelled and within the ranks towards the deemed responsible for their hardship. Why were they resentful? Hardship. I don't know, because they're ter terribly happy with their conditions. Naked and cold in the winter. Yeah, what a concept. Naked they're trying to chop down winter. wood at the same time. Instead of naked and afraid, it's naked and cold. Naked and cold. <laughs> naked and cold and afraid of the guy with the axe. <laughs> anyway, on uh, December the 23rd, Washington wrote to Henry Lawrence, the president of the Continental Congress. Washington related how his commanders had just exerted themselves with some difficulty to quell, to quell a dangerous mutiny formenting because of the lack of provision. Washington continued with a dire warning to Congress. Unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place in that line, 
the army must inevitably reduce to one or the other of these things, starve, dissolve, or disperse in order to obtain substance in the best manner they can. While Washington dealt with serious circumstances, he might have exaggerated slightly to obtain a quicker response from Congress. No. No, not, not Washington. I can't lie. He can't lie. No. Well, that winter was not particularly harsh at Valley Forge, but many soldiers remained unfit for duty owing to their disease, lack of proper clothing and uniforms. They could refer to the ragged or inappropriately attired individual. Years later, Lafayette recalled that the unfortunate soldiers were in want of everything. They had neither coats, hats, shirts, nor shoes. Their feet and legs froze until they'd become almost black, well, then. and it was often necessary to amputate them. Well, then. I have given my foot for the... No, never mind. <laughs> uh, on January the 7th, Christopher Marshall related how ten teams of oxen fit for slaughtering came into camp driven by loyal Philadelphia women. They also brought 2,000 shirts smuggled from the city, sewn under the eyes of the enemy. While these women pro uh, provided crucial assistance, most people remain relatively unaware that the Continental Army's plight, the unavoidable result of general policy to prevent such intelligence from reading the British. Understandable. Now, the outlook for the Army situation improved when a five-man congressional delegation arrived on the January 24th. The delegates consisted of Francis Dana from Massachusetts, Nathaniel Folsom from New Hampshire, John Harvey from Virginia, Governor Morris from New York, and Joseph Reed from Pennsylvania. According to historian Wade Bodie, uh, or Bodle, I should say, they came to understand that through their visit how vulnerable the new army could be to logistical disruption owing to its size, its organizational complexity, and increasing mobility. Washington and his aides convinced them to implement recommended reforms to the supply department, and in March 1778, Congress also appointed Nathaniel Green as quartermaster general, who reluctantly accepted at Washington's behest. One of the Continental Army's most able generals, Green did not want an administrative position, yet he and his staff better supplied the troops at a time when the weather and road conditions began to improve. The Shikill River also thawed, allowing the Continental Army to more easily transport convoys from the main supply depot at Reading. Now, maintaining club cleanliness was a challenge for the Continental Army. Scabbies broke out because of their filthy conditions with the main encampment, as did other daily, deadlier elements. The army had a limited water supply for cooking, washing and bathing, dead horse remains often laid unburied, and Washington found the smell of some places intolerable. What? Neither plumbing nor a standardized system of trash collection existed. Uh, to combat the spread of contagion, Washington commended commanded soldiers to burn tar or the powder of a musket cartridge in the huts every day to cleanse the air of putr putrefaction. On May 27th, Washington had ordered soldiers to remove the mud and straw chinking from huts to render them as airy as possible. Outbreaks of typhoid and dysentery spread through the contaminated food and water. Soldiers contracted influenza and pneumonia, while others succumbed to typhus caused by body lice. Although the inconsistent delivery of food rations did not cause starvation, it probably exacerbated the health of ailing soldiers. Some patients might have suffered from more than one ailment, and a total of between 1,700 and 2,000 troops died during the Valley Forge encampment, mostly at general hospitals in six different towns. Valley Forge had the highest mortality rate of any Continental Army encampment, and even most military engagements of the war. Now, despite the mortality rate, Washington did curb the spread of smallpox, which had plagued the Continental Army since the American Revolution had begun in 1775. In 1777, Washington ordered a mass inoculation for his troops, but a year later at Valley Forge, smallpox broke out again. The investigation uncovered that three to 4,000 troops had not received inoculations despite having long-term enlistments. So Washington ordered the inoculations for any soldiers vulnerable to the disease. Now, a precursor to vaccination introduced by Edward Jenner in 1798, inoculation gave a patient a milder form of smallpox with better recovery rates than if the patient had acquired the disease naturally. The procedure provided lifetime immunity from a disease with roughly a 15 to 33 percent mortality rate. In June of 1778, when the Continental Army marched out of Valley Forge, 
they completed the first large-scale state-sponsored immunization campaign in history. By continuing the inoculation program for new recruits, Washington better maintained the military strength among the regular Continental Army troops throughout the remainder of the war. Now, while each hut housed a square, a squad of 12 enlisted soldiers, sometimes soldiers' families, joined them to share that space as well. Throughout the encampment period, Mary Ludwig Hayes and approximately 250 to 400 other women had followed their soldiers' husbands or sweethearts to Valley Forge. Hey, they get bonus points. Sometimes with children in tow. They get bonus <laughs> points. I... That's all I can say. I can't imagine having a child in that. Oh, that would be crazy. Washington once wrote that the multitude of women in particular, especially those who are pregnant or have children, are a clog upon every movement. Well, that's true. I can see that. Yeah, yet women on the whole proved invaluable, whether on the march or an encampment like Valley Forge. They often earned income by laundering clothes or by nursing troops, which kept soldiers cleaner and healthier. In turn, this made the troops appear more professional and disciplined. Up there at Fort Meade, they had that one section that was all for the women to right. wash laundry and fix uh, in tailors. So, um, Lucy Fluker Knox, Catherine Littlefield, Katie Green, and other seniors officers' wives journeyed to Valley Forge at the behest of their husbands. On the 22nd of December, Martha Washington predicted her husband would send for her as soon as his army went into winter quarter and that if he does, I must go. Indeed, she did, traveling in wartime with a group of slaves no. over pro, poor roads. You say no? I just say no. <laughs> Reaching the destination in mid-February, Washington's aide-de-camp, Colonel Richard Kidder Meade, met her at the Susquehanna Ferry Dock to escort her to the encampment. And over the next six months, Martha hosted political leaders and military officials managing domestic staff within the confined space of Washington's headquarters. Martha was one of the many important women at Valley Forge. She also organized meals and kept spirits high during the rough times of the encampment. Now, Valley Forge had a high percentage of racial and ethnic diversity since Washington's army comprised individuals from all 13 states. About 30% of the Continental uh, soldiers at Valley Forge didn't even speak English as their first language. Well then. Uh, many soldiers and commanders hailed for German-speaking communities, as with Pennsylvania-born Brigadier General Peter Mullenberg, still others spoke Scottish or Irish Gaelic, and a few descended from French-speaking Huguenot and Dutch-speaking communities in New York. Local residents sometimes conversed in Welsh. Several senior officers in the Continental Army originally came from France, Prussia, Poland, Ireland, and Hungary. Although Native and African-American men served the Continental Armies as drovers, wagoneers, and laborers, Others fought as soldier, particularly from Rhode Island and Massachusetts. The smallest of these states, Rhode Island, had a difficulty meeting recruitment quotas for white men, mm -hmm. spurring Brigadier General James uh, Mitchell Varnum to suggest the enlistment of slaves for his first Rhode Island regiment. I like that. Over a four-month period in 1778, the Rhode Island General Assembly allowed for their recruitment. In exchange for listing soldiers of the first Rhode Island regiment, gained immediate emancipation and their former owners received financial compensation equal to the slave's market value. They bought their freedom for 117 enslaved, recruit, enslaved recruits before the law, allowing them to do so was repealed, but these free African-American soldiers continued to enlist in the military. By January of 1778, nearly 10% of Washington's effective force consisted of African-American troops. That's not bad. Yeah. Now, commanders brought servants and enslaved people with them to the encampment, usually black people. Washington's slave, enslaved domestic staff included his manservant, William Lee, as well as cooks Hannah Till and her husband, Isaac. Uh, William Lee had married Margaret Thomas, a free black woman who worked as a laundress at William's headquarters, Washington's headquarters. Hannah Till's legal owner, Reverend John Mason, led her out to Washington, but Hannah secured an arrangement whereby she eventually bought her freedom. In the spring of 1778, Wappinger, Oneida, and Tuscarosa warriors were on the side of the Patriots, with prominent Oneida leader Joseph Lewis Cook of the St. Regis Mohawk among them had joined the Americans at Valley Forge. Both served as scouts, keeping an eye out for British raiding parties in the area, and in May of 1778 they fought under Lafayette at Barren Hill. In an oral history to the Oneida people, 
the prominent Oneida woman named Polly Cooper brought hundreds of bushels of white corn to hungry troops, teaching them how to process it for safe consumption. During the Revolutionary War, most Native American tribes sided with the British in order to protect their traditional homelands from the encroachment of American settlers. However, several tribes, including the Oneida, sided with the Patriots due in parts of tides with American settlers, such as the Presbyterian minister Samuel Kirkland. The Seven Nations of Canada and the Iroquois at what would be the Six Nations Reserve were who most immigrants from the colony of New York were brought to the brink of war by the Anglo-American conflict. Now, part of the issue they had, again, poor organization was the major challenge facing the Continental Army during the Valley Forge winter. Two years of war, shuffling leadership, and uneven recruitment resulted in an irregular unit organization and strength. During the Valley Forge encampment, the Army was reorganized into five divisions under Major Generals Charles Lee, Marquis de Lafayette, Johann de Kalb, William Alexander Lord Sterling, with Brigadier General Anthony Wayne serving in place of Mifflin. Unit strength in terms of service became more standardized, improving the, com the Continental Army's efficiency. William enjoyed support among the enlisted soldiers, but commissioned officers and congressional offers, officials were not enthusiastic. Uh, during the Valley Forge winter, William Washington's dis detractors attacked his leadership and ability both in private correspondence and popu popular publications. One anonymous letter in January 1778 disparaged Washington, saying, The proper method of attacking, beating, and conquering the enemy has never as yet been adapted by the commander-in-chief. Now, the most organized threat to Washington's leadership was by what was called the Conway Cabal. This cabal consisted of a handful of military officers and American politicians who attempted to replace Washington with Major General Horatio Gates as the head of the Continental Army. This movement was nominally led by Thomas Conway, a foreign Continental Army general and a critic of Washington's leadership. A series of leaks and embarrassing exposures in the fall and winter of 1777 and 78 dissolved the Kapal and Washington's reputation improved. Oh, no. Now, increasing military efficiency, morale, and discipline improved the Army's well-building along with the better supply of food and arms. The Continental Army had been hindered in battle because units administered training from a variety of field manuals making coordinated battle movements awkward and difficult. They struggled with basic formations, lacked uniformity, thanks to multiple drilling techniques taught by various ways by different officers. Baron Frederick von Steuben, a Prussian drill master who recently arrived from Europe, instituted a rigorous training program for the troops. He drilled the soldiers, improving their battle and formation techniques, and under Steuben's leadership, the Continentals practiced volley fire, improved their maneuverability, standardized the march practices, existed uh, exercise skirmishing operations, and drilled bayonet proficiency. These new efforts to train and discipline the army also improved morale among the soldiers. Now, initially, France remained reluctant to directly involve themselves in a war against Great Britain. In part, they worried the revolutionary fervor might spread to their own empire, which it did by 1789, but they also did, did not think the American colonists could win. However, by October 1777, surrender of British General John Burgoyne's army at Saratoga won for Americans the assistance they needed from foreign powers. France and the United States subsequently signed a treaty in February of 1778, creating a military alliance between the two countries. I hate when I want to sneeze. Nope. <laughs> now, uh, because they signed a treaty with the United States, uh, General uh, Great Britain that declared war on France five weeks later on March 17th. You bullies. On May 6th, already having received word of the French alliance, Washington ordered the General Ar Continental Army to perform a grand fuisage, a formal ceremony consisting of a rapid and sequential firing of guns down the ranks. Continental officer George Ewing wrote that the troops then shouted three cheers, long live the King of France. After this, three cheers and the shout of God save the friendly powers of Europe, and cheers and a shout of God save the American states. Each soldier received an extra gill of rum, about four ounces, to enjoy the day, 
And after the office, after the troops' dismissal, Washington and other officers drank as many patriotic toasts and concluded the day with harmless mirth and jollity. They had a cause for celebration, as empires, both France and Great Britain, had territory around the world that required protection. Sir Henry Clinton replaced Sir William Howe as British Commander-in-Chief of Land Forces of North America and had to divert troops from the Philadelphia from Philadelphia to the Crown's valuable possessions of the West Indies. Ooh, look, they're trying to move pieces around. Um, the British also feared the French naval blockade of Philadelphia, so in June, Clinton abandoned it for New York City, a loyalist stronghold. On June the 18th, Washington's troops marched after them, and with the remainder vacating Valley Forge one day later, exactly six months after the Continental Army had arrived. Nice. Hang out in the other valley for six months. Yeah, you know, recharge, re refurbish. Now, freeze. Freeze. <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but... Anyway, so the forces marched south and central New Jersey on their way to New York City. The British destroyed property and confiscated supplies and food, inspired growing enmity among the area civilians. Meanwhile, small-scale cooperative operations between the Continentals and New Jersey militia harassed, them and harassed the exhausted British forces. The armies met at the morning of June 28th, beginning the Battle of Monmouth. Continental soldiers under the command of Char General Charles Lee engaged the British in approximately five hours of continuous fighting in ferocious heat. That night, the British General Sir Henry Clinton moved his army out of Freehold and resumed the march to Manhattan. Both sides claimed elements of victory. The British Army completed its march to New York City, while the Continental Army had forced the battle and performed admirably in an open field. Their standardization training instilled at Valley Forge had improved the performance on the battlefield. But that is our uh, little history tidbit for the day when George Washington decided to uh, basically bunk out in Valley Forge and uh, start the beginning of the recuperation of the Continental Army. Say good night. Good night, folks. <laughs>